programs we had dealt with the mansabdari and the jagirdari systems during the mogul period in this program we shall deal with the zamindari system zameen in persian means land and dar refers to the one who holds it so zamindar means land holder can it then mean that he owns the land on the understanding and interpretation of these two concepts hung the entire polity of the mogul empire who is the owner of the land let us briefly examine the history of the zamindari system zamindari system flourished in the mogul empire although it has developed through centuries of various experiments it has been stated that there is no pargana in the mogul empire where there is no zamindar but we find that there are certain villages ruled by the panchayats where there is no zamindar although there is some official who is the headman of the village or muqaddam the differences between the zamindars not only between different types of zamindars but also within the zamindari system the officials could be seen in the mogul empire very clearly due to the evolution of the system the debate that came in 1793 when the english tried to introduce the permanent settlement was actually started by mid 17th century french traveler françois barnier barnier stated that the king is the owner of all land this statement has been accepted by most of the travelers who came after barnier when we come to the period before 1793 we find that there is a considerable dispute between the english officials and their indian officials as well for example philip francis he held the view that zamindar is the malik that is the owner of the land warren hastings and richard barwell they more or less agreed with this statement but the indian officials did not at least most of them did not for example shitab rai who is the naib dewan of bihar he stated that zamindar is the malik of the land it is true but king is the owner of the revenue another contemporary indian officials ram ram choudhury was a kanungo he said that zamindar and the king were the joint owners of the land raja raj ballav who played a leading role at one point of time and who was ruling bihar on behalf of the nawab he said that the king is the owner of all land slightly later in the late 18th century reza khan who was the naib of the english in bengal stated that king is not the owner of all land so therefore there are various kinds of opinion prevalent among the contemporary indian officials on the malikana or the proprietary right of the zamindar 
W. H. Morland, the English historian, was also a land revenue official of the English company, stated that there were semi-independent zamidars during the Mughal period and they were very powerful. In the recent days, Paramatma Saran, a noted Indian historian, who had written Provincial Government of the Mughals, he said that zamidars are not found in all parts of the Mughal Empire and they were not also that much of powerful. Saran has a problem. The problem was that he has used the faulty translation of Abul Fazal's Aini Akbari by Blockman, and therefore he came to the false conclusion. <laughs> But if we look at the Zamidas under the Mughals, we see two contradictory features. First, the Zamindar wants the protection of the king, but he does not want to obey his diktat. Second, the king wants the revenue raised by the Zamindar, but he does not want to give freedom to the Zamindar. And throughout the Mughal period, we see that these two tendencies continue to work as before. Now, in the Zamedari system, therefore, there was cooperation and struggle, cooperation and conflict, very clearly seen. Now, regarding the Malikana of the Zamedar, there is a considerable dispute. As I have said, the Indian officials, they were not very sure about this. The English, for their own justification of the permanent settlement, which was introduced in Bengal, considered the Zamedars as the owner of land. Now, after Making this kind of formulation, the English changed the land revenue system. The Mughal system was that they would take the revenue from the harvest, a portion of the harvest, which we would see a bit later. While the English company after 1793 began to take land revenue from the land irrespective of the harvest. So from the English point of view, the term land revenue is perfectly all right. But from the Mughal point of view, the term land revenue is not a very correct one because the revenue is not from land. It is from the harvest. And that also depends very much on the kind of crop that is coming up. If there is a commercial crop, the rate is higher. If there is no crop, there is no revenue. So therefore, the two systems are different. The British rulers considered the zamindars as owners of the land, the manik. Therefore, the land revenue was imposed irrespective of the utilization of the land. The onus of collecting the revenue was on the zamindars. But leaving that apart, there were different documents which we have of the early midi of the, of the early Mughal period or late Mughal period. If we start from the late one, the mid-17th century, last Devan of Gujarat, he wrote a book called Mirat e Ahmadi. His name was Ali Muhammad Khan. Now, Ali Muhammad Khan stated 
that the Mughal revenue or during the Mughal period the revenue was divided into two. One is called Banth, B-A-N-T-H, which is taken by the Jamaidar. The other is called Talpad, T-A-L-P-A-D, which is taken by the state or the central government. We find more or less the same in another document of the early days. The Subadar of Gujarat, Khani Azam, in the late 16th century, gave certain orders regarding the collection of revenue. There are three main points in the order of Khani Azam, the Subadar of Gujarat. One, one fourth of the land should be reserved for the Aboriginal people and no revenue should be taken from them. Two, the Zamindar should not collect more than 50% of the total harvest as revenue. Three, there is no restriction on the Zamindars for the sale or purchase of land. In other words, it means that if the revenue is paid, then the Zamaidar can do almost anything. Now, this kind of the document that we have of Khani Azam giving far more latitude to the Zamaidars perhaps was prevalent all over the Mughal Empire. Unfortunately, we do not have any such corroborative evidences from other provinces. There were three types of Jamidars. The first one is the very big Jamidars, almost called the Rajars. In Persian, these were called Jamidaran e Umda, U M D A. The second one is the middle level Jamidar, neither big nor very small. The third one is the primary Jamidar. The problem, there is a problem of uh, abstraction here. The problem is that these types are not exclusive to each other. In other, other words, the, in a big Jamidari, there may be small Jamidars, Almost certainly there are small Jamidars and there are also primary Jamidars. But the big Jamidar is himself a primary Jamidar in a certain area. So therefore these types, although classified separately, these types overlap each other and one has to see very clearly what kind of Zamedar the person is. Now, if we take first the big Zamedars, we see that all the Zamedars are not the same kind. Abu Fazal, in talking about the big Zamedar, said that there were two types of big Zamedars. One is the Zamaidar of the terri territory. For example, the Raja of Jammu and Kangra. And the second type was the Zamaidar of the tribe. Very big Zamaidar. Like the Raja of Baluch. And he calls the second one the Zamaidar of the tribe, as Alus, L-U-S. Now the difference between the two, although Abul Fazal classified it separately, 
is very small. It is true that the zamidar of the tribe has his strength mainly based on the strength of the tribe. But in the first, the zamidar of the territory, the zamidar is also the leader of his tribe, which is perhaps the dominant tribe, but there are other racial groups involved. So therefore, the internal politics of these two are different. In case of a tribal one, it was a simple matter. In case of the territory, that is a difficult matter. Now, these big zamidas were asked by the central government to send tribute, which is called peshkash, P-E-S-H-K-S-H, -E -S -S peshkash. Now, there are two types of peshkash. One is that some zamidars are asked to pay tribute or peshkash, and they are also asked to give military help. And the second one is those who only pay peshkash, and no military help was asked from them. So they are called Peshkashi Zamidar. Both types of Zamindars paid tribute. But we do not know the basis on which tribute was paid by those Zamindars who provided military help. We get some information from Aini Agbari about the payment made by the second type of Zamindars. The second type of Peshkashi Zamindar, that is those who pay tribute only, perhaps they pay on the basis of their own revenue. Because we find that Abul Fazal had given the list of their revenue in his Aini Akbari. Now, the big Jamidas are very, very powerful. That has been acknowledged by the central government. Babar in his Baba Nama stated that these big zamidars are very powerful. They control one sixth of the entire land. They have plenty of elephants, he has given the number, the guns, soldiers, etc. And he said the only advantage for us is that they are not united. So it is easy to defeat them. Now the Peshkashi Jamidar, like all other Jamidars, try to remain independent while the Mughal government tries to convert them as revenue-paying Jamidar, or in Persian term, Mal Guzari Jamidar. Mal is the revenue. So, mal guzari zamedar or revenue paying zamedar. So, there is a, always a kind of a tussle going on. How frequently the tribute is paid is not known. Generally, whenever the emperor goes near the zamedari or his representative comes near to that place, the zamedars then personally come and pay their respects and their revenue as well, which is called peshkash or tribute. On this, there had been problems also. For example, in case of Bengal in 1610, Pratapaditya of Jasor, a very big zamedar, perhaps the leading zamedar of Bengal then, was called Jor Talab zamedar that is rebel Jamidar, because he did not personally come 
to see the subadar. So, therefore, there are all sorts of rules and regulations, etiquettes concerning the Mughals and the Zamaidar. Now, apart from these Peshkashi Zamaidar, there were certain other areas where the Zamaidar pays the revenue and as I have said, these are called the Mal Guzari Zamaidar. Akbar in 1592-93 issued a Farman, an order stating that all Zamaidars under the Mughals either should attend the court or send his son or representative of his tribe as a sort of zamin, the security. Abu Fazal said in 1595-96 that there were 27 such uh, zamins from Lahore alone. Now, to control these zamidas, this was one of the measures. And this led to trouble between the zamidas and the Mughals. For example, Rana Pratap of Chitor did not want to attend, neither he wanted his son to attend. So, as we know, Akbar invaded Chitor, Pratap left for the hills. But during the time of Jahangir, he exempted the Chitor Raja from sending the Jamin and the problem was solved. So therefore, this kind of attendance created a problem at one point of time. It is generally believed that in the later years, this rule was not strictly followed. But then we do not know about this very clearly. Another way to control the big zamidas, which was taken by Akbar, was the marriage between the uh, emperor and the daughter of the big Hindu zamidar. The first such marriage was in 1563, when Akbar married the daughter of Raja Biharimal of Ambar, that is Jaipur. And it is stated by later historians that the rise of the Ambar family was due to this marriage. Now, if we look at Abul Fazal's list, which has been given, it has been seen that in 1595-96, there were 61 Jamidan Mansabdas. Out of this 61, 40 came from Jaipur Ajmer area. Out of this 40, 27 came from the Kachwa family of Ambar. So, therefore, it is claimed that the rise of the Ambar family in the Mughal administrative system, Raja Man Singh became Subadar and so on and so forth, this was due to this factor. But now, in the recent researches, it has been seen that this statement is not correct. There are certain other Rajputs was given their daughters and had gone up, but there were also certain other Rajput, Jamidas or Rajas, who had not given their daughters in marriage, they had also gone up in the Mughal administrative system. So therefore, this 
question this statement by the later historians, particularly late 19th and early 20th century, this cannot be accepted. In this connection, I may mention the problem of Jodhabai. In 1873, in the Journal of the Asiatic Society, Calcutta, Beveridge wrote that it is the, the daughter of Biharimal was called Jodhabai, etc., etc. And he was considered the mother of Jahangir. Since then, the controversy has started rather snowballed into great discussion. But the recent view of the historians is that first of all, the name of the daughter of the Raja Biharimal is not known. Jahangir never mentioned the name of his mother. Thirdly, any Hindu daughter coming into the Mughal family is given a royal title and the daughter of Biharimal was also given a royal title and she has issued certain firmans which normally they do or almost all the queens do. These firmans have been found but no name was given. Actually it appears that Jahangir has married the daughter of the Raja of Jodhpur, who was called Jodhabai. So therefore, this uh, connection between the daughter of Raja Bihari Malabambar, Akbar, and Salim is very tenuous, to say the least. <laughs>